Thank you very much, everyone. Before I begin, I'd like to offer my condolences and best wishes to the people all across our great South who have endured deadly tornadoes and other severe weather in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, and South Carolina. My administration will do everything possible to help those communities get back on their feet. We're speaking with the governors and representatives. FEMA is already on its way, and they got there as soon as we heard the word. I said, get out there. So FEMA is there, and you know, you know the great job that FEMA does. It's really something very special. So uh, we just want to say uh, warmest condolences, and, and uh, we're with you all the way. It's a tough deal. That was a bad, bad uh, level five. That was a bad group. That's as high as it gets. It was a bad grouping of tornadoes, something that's uh, something incredible. The power, the horrible, destructive power. America is continuing to make critical progress in our war against the virus. Over the weekend, the number of daily new infections remained flat, nationwide flat. Hospitalizations are slowing in hot spots like New York, New Jersey, Michigan, and Louisiana. This is clear evidence that our aggressive strategy to combat the virus is working and that Americans are following the guidelines. It's been incredible what they've done. Uh, you looked at the charts, and the charts are, and the models uh, from early on predictions where 100 and 120,000 people look like if they did well, they were going to unfortunately perish. And uh, we're going to be hopefully way, way below that number. So that will be uh, a sign of people doing things right, but it's still just a horrible thing all over the world. 184 countries. This is all a tribute to our wonderful healthcare advisors and experts who have uh, been with us right from the beginning. We appreciate it so much. In fact, uh, Dr. Fauci's here. Maybe I could ask Tony to say a few words before we uh, go any further. Thank you very much. Tony, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a, one, a couple of things, and then I just want to make a comment about something that happened yesterday. You're going to hear from Dr. Uh, Burke soon about the numbers that we've been talking about, how things are starting to balance off. And I think the more as we go by each day, I think we're going to see, and again, I never like to get ahead of myself or uh, of Dr. Burks, but it looks like even though we've had a really bad week last week, remember when I was speaking to you before, I was saying this was really a bad week, uh, there's still going to be a lot of deaths, but we're starting to see in some areas now that kind of flattening, particularly in a place that was a hot spot like New York. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I had a really very, very productive conversation with the Congressional Black Caucus uh, this morning uh, for about an hour, and they really wanted to know what exactly are we going to be doing in the immediate as well as the long range about the health disparities and the discrepancies both in infection and in poor outcome in the minorities in general, but specifically African American. And I mean, I made it very clear to them that what we have to do is focus on getting the resources where the vulnerable are to be able to get testing done, to be able to get the appropriate um, uh, identification where are proper and where appropriate to isolate and contact trace if we can, but also to help mitigate in a community that is, is suffering and suffering much more disproportionately. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. The other point I wanted to make is that I, I, I had uh, an interview yesterday that I was asked a, a hypothetical question. Uh, and hypothetical questions sometimes can get you into some difficulty because it's what would have or could have. The nature of the hypothetical question was if, in fact, we had mitigated earlier, could lives have been saved? And the answer to my question was, as I always do, and I'm doing right now, perfectly honestly, say yes. I mean, obviously, if you, mitigation helps, I've been up here many times telling you that mitigation works. So if mitigation works, and you instigate it and, and you initiate it earlier, you will probably have saved more lives. If you initiated it later, you probably would have lost more lives. You initiate it at a certain time. That was taken as a way that maybe somehow something was at fault here. So let me tell you from my experience, 
and I can only speak from my own experience, is that we had been talking before any meetings that we had about the pros and the cons, the effectiveness or not of strong mitigations. So discussions were going on mostly among the medical people about what that would mean. The first and only time that Dr. Burks and I went in and formally made a recommendation to the president to actually have a, quote, shutdown in the sense of not really shutdown, but to really have strong mitigation. We discussed it. Obviously, there would be concern by some that, in fact, that might have some negative consequences. Nonetheless, the president listened to the recommendation and went to the mitigation. The next second time that I went with Dr. Burks into the president and said, 15 days are not enough. We need to go 30 days. Obviously, there were people who had a problem with that because of the potential secondary effects. Nonetheless, at that time, the president went with the health recommendations, and we extended it another 30 days. So I can only tell you what I know and what my recommendations were. But clearly, as happens all the time, there were interpretations of that response to a hypothetical question that I just thought it would be very nice for me to clarify because I didn't have the chance to clarify. Thank you. You know, I, to be honest with you, I don't even remember what the date was, but I can just tell you the first and only time that I went in and said we should do mitigation strongly, the response was yes, we'll do it. And what did he do? Is that the travel restrictions? No. Uh, the travel restriction is separate. That was whether or not we wanted to go into a mitigation stage of 15 days of mitigation. The travel was another recommendation when we went in and said we probably should be doing that, and the answer was yes. And then another time was we should do it with Europe, and the answer was yes. And the next time we should do it with the UK, and the answer was yes. In this interview, you said there was pushback. Yeah. Where did that pushback come no, from? No, it wasn't, and that was the wrong choice of words. You know what it was when people discuss not necessarily in front of the president, when people discuss, they say, well, you know, this is gonna have maybe a harmful effect on this or on that. So it was a poor choice of words. There wasn't anybody saying, no, you shouldn't do that. Are you doing this voluntarily or did no, the president- No, I'm doing it. I, uh, everything I do is voluntarily, please. Don't even imply that. So, okay. so Mr. President, the question and By the way, the travel ban, that was earlier. The travel ban was done earlier. And if you look at statistics, I happen to write a couple of them down. If you look at statistics, so on January 6th, that's long before the dates you're talking about, there were CDC issued a travel notice for Wuhan, China, a notice before there was even a confirmed case of the virus in the United States. That's on January 6th. This is all documented uh, because we have so much fake news. I like to document things. January 6th. Long before the dates we're talking about, CDC issued travel notice to Wuhan, for Wuhan. On January 11th, we have zero cases in the United States. Zero. We don't have any cases. So there are no cases reported that we know of. This is January 11th. The CDC issued a level one travel notice health for health while there were still no confirmed cases. So we had zero cases. People want me to act. I'm supposed to close down the economy, the greatest economy in the history of the world, and we don't have one case confirmed in the United States. That's January 11th. On January 17th, the CDC began implementing public health entry screenings at three major U.S. airports that received the greatest volume of passengers from Wuhan, at my instructions. There was not a single case of the coronavirus in the United States. So on January 17th, there wasn't a case, and the fake news is saying, oh, he didn't act fast enough. Well, you remember what happened, because when I did act, I was criticized by Nancy Pelosi, by sleepy Joe Biden. I was criticized by everybody. In fact, I was called xenophobic. I was asking Biden to please define that for me. I was called other things by Democrats, and some others, not too many others, actually. So that, by the media, definitely. Now, on January 21st, this is long before the time we're talking, because when Tony, Tony's talking, I believe he's talking about the end of February. On January 21st, okay, still early, there was one case of the 
virus. At that time, we called it the Wuhan virus, right? Wuhan. There was one case in the whole United States. We had one case. This is all documented. It all comes from you. A lot of it comes from you people. On January 21st, the CDC activated an emergency operations center. There was just one case, one person. That's why that ad was such a phony. There was one person in the United States. You know, they use the ad, there's only one person. That, that statement was made at that time. One case in the whole United States, one case. I'm supposed to shut down the government, the biggest, the biggest uh, economy in the history of the world. Shut it down. We have one case. Seven cases were on January 31st. Now, on January 21st, there was a case. Not one person had died. You heard that, Steve, right? Not one person. So we have this massive country, the United States of America. We have the greatest economy in the world, bigger than China's by a lot, right? Because of what we've done over the last three and a half years prior to the virus, but including the virus. So we have the biggest economy, the greatest economy we've ever had, the highest employment numbers, the best employment numbers, best unemployment numbers also, the best of everything. So on January 31st, think of it, not one person has died. Not one. Nobody died. Not one, John. You, I don't think you'll find any. This is reported by CDC, confirmed by the news, which doesn't mean anything to me because uh, they don't tell the truth. But CDC reported, January 31st, not one person has died, and I issued a travel restriction from China. Think of it. So nobody died, and I issued. You can't get earlier than that. So we have nobody died, and I said, China, you can't come in. I'm sorry, because I saw what was going on. It wasn't so much what I was told. It was that I saw what was going on, and I didn't like it. I didn't speak to Tony about it. Didn't speak to very many people about it. I didn't like it. So what did I do? Ready? January 31st, in the United States, not one person had died because of the, again, the Wuhan virus. So I issued travel restrictions on that date, even though nobody died, and I got brutalized over it by the press because I was way too early. I shouldn't have done it. Brutalized by the press. But you know, sort of, I've been brutalized for the last four years. I used to do well before I decided to run for politics. But I guess I'm doing okay because, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the President of the United States, despite the things that are said. So then, first mandatory quarantine in more than 50 years, we did. First mandatory in 50 years. The same restrictions that the Democrats and the media called xenophobic. Now, Joe Biden said he's a racist. Call me a racist because I said, we're shutting down entry from China. We're shutting it down. He called me xenophobic and he called me a racist and other things. Since then, on a Friday night two weeks ago, Joe Biden issued a say It wasn't him. He didn't write it. I'm sure he doesn't even know that it was issued. But the people from his campaign, who are smart, people that write his little PR releases are pretty smart, reasonably good, not the best, but they're not bad. But they issued a statement saying that Joe Biden uh, agrees that, the pres that President Trump was right to close it down to China. Now, he did that. Now, he issued it on a Friday night. We've all heard about that, John, Friday nights, right? In fact, his was later Friday night than I ever released mine on Friday nights, okay? <laughs> So he did, he did it pretty late. I mean, you know, like at 11 o'clock in the evening or something, you know, it's pretty late. Anyway, so Joe Biden issued, and it's one of those things. But in February, Nancy Pelosi said we should come to Chinatown. This is late February. Come to Chinatown. We think it's very safe. Come here. Let's all have the big parade, Chinatown parade, probably referring to San Francisco. And that's it. But I took this action early. And so the story in the New York Times was a total fake. It's a fake newspaper, and they write fake stories. And someday, hopefully in five years when I'm not here, those papers are all going out of business because nobody's going to want to read them. But now they like them because they write about me. Now, with that, I have a couple of interesting — we have a few uh, clips that we're just going to put up. We could turn the lights a little bit lower. I think you'll find them interesting. And then we'll — Answer some questions. I'll ask you some questions, because you're so guilty, but 
forget it. Uh, but most importantly, we're going to get back onto the reason we're here, which is the success we're having. Okay? Uh, please, you can put it on. Thank you. People should be more concerned right now with the flu in this country. A lot of people are concerned about the coronavirus because they're hearing a lot of news about it right now. But the reality is, comparing it to the flu, for example, it's not even close to being at that stage. What if it is worse? Is this a moment where maybe countries put politics aside, a little bit of pride aside, and do we have U.S. officials? Should U.S. professionals such as yourself get involved? How worried should Americans be about coronavirus? Coronavirus is not going to cause a major is the United States. Well, we've asked them to accelerate whatever they're doing in terms of a vaccine. We will be suspending all travel from Europe to the United States for the next 30 days. To unleash the full power of the federal government in this effort today, I am officially declaring a national emergency. Medicare patients can now visit any doctor by phone or video conference at no additional cost. The first one million masks will be available immediately. as there were more cases, and it was clear that it was spreading out of China, where it originated. The president took this move that he was widely criticized for by Democrats and even some Republicans at the time, which was he halted a number of flights from China into the U.S. The idea was to halt the spread of the disease, keep transmissions to a minimum. He was accused of xenophobia. He was accused of making a racist move. At the end of the day, it was probably effective because yeah. it did actually take a pretty aggressive measure against the spread of the virus. His team is on it. They've been responsive late at night, early in the morning, uh, and they've uh, thus far been doing everything that they can do, and I want to say thank you. And I want to say that I appreciate it. He returns calls. He reaches out. Uh, he's been proactive. Uh, we got that mercy ship down here in Los Angeles. That was directly because he sent it down here. 2,000 uh, medical uh, units came to the state of California, these FMS, these, these field medical stations. Uh, and that's been very, very helpful. The president has been... Uh... Uh, outstanding uh, through all this. The vice president's been outstanding. Members of the coronavirus task force, very responsive. We had asked if we could have, New Jersey could have access to a piece of the beds that are on the USNS Comfort, and the president came back, called me a short few minutes before I walked in here to say, indeed, they would grant that to New Jersey. So that's a big step for us, in addition to all the other capacity. That news is literally hot off the press. And I thank the president and vice president who are on the call together. President Trump approved Arizona's request for a presidential major disaster declaration. I want to thank the president for a quick turnaround. We requested this on a Wednesday and we had approval by Saturday morning. And we are grateful to the administration for their continued support and responsiveness. Well, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, the, the, the president, the vice president, for doing a really good job of communicating with all the governors. So we could give you hundreds of clips like that from governors, including Democratic, or Democrat as I call them, governors, which is actually the correct term. Uh, we could give you hundreds of clips just like that. We have them. Uh, we didn't want this to go on too long, but I just want to say, it's, uh, you know, it's very sad when people write false stories like, in that case, I guess it was gotten mostly from the New York Times, which is a highly, I mean, if you had libel laws, uh, they would have been out of business even before they'll end up going out of business. So it's too bad. But we could have given, you saw the statements, we have hundreds of statements, hundreds of statements, including from Democrats and Democrat governors. And if you look, they were all saying, we need ventilators, we need, you don't hear ventilators anymore. They have all the ventilators they need, which we were right about. We said, you're asking for too many, you don't need that. And in all fairness, these two people right here, Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, they said, I don't think they need that many ventilators. I said, I agree. 
at one point, and I'm not knocking New York for this, but they were asking, you remember, 40,000 ventilators. And that's more than they have all over the country. And we got them a lot of ventilators, and nobody's complained. We got them, as you know, beautiful. We built hospital rooms all over the country. Uh, the governor of uh, Louisiana, John Bell Edwards, was very nice. He said, you know what, you don't have to build the second hospital. Because good news is happening. They're not able to fill the beds. They needed two hospitals. We built one. It was perfect. We're getting, we're just starting the other. I called him up. I said, do you think we should build the second one? I don't think you're going to need it. He said, let me get back. He got back. We didn't need it. Uh, with uh, Governor Cuomo, in all good spirit and faith, he wanted to have the Jacob Javits Center uh, done. And we built 2,900 incredible beds, incredible. Then we make it, uh, we made it COVID and or to be exactly accurate, COVID-19, and uh, which was a lot of work. We had to change the duct work. We had to seal up certain areas. We had to put uh, areas of uh, rooftop things over the beds. We did a lot of work, and we had it. But they never really had too much use for it. And they called also Mayor de Blasio. Rightfully, he called. He said, would it be possible to get more medical help? So now, not only are we building facilities, we're they're asking us for help because they're unable to man it. And we got him the help. We got Mayor de Blasio a lot of help. Then, uh, when the uh, Javits Center wasn't used much, and then, as you know, the Mercy, we took the Mercy and we took the Comfort, and uh, we made them both Los Angeles and New York. Uh, we made them uh, COVID adaptable, which was not easy to do. And we didn't get almost any people sent there. Uh, they didn't need them at the beginning because uh, they didn't need it for anything but this because there were fewer accidents, fewer motorcycles, fewer everything. And what we did was like an incredible job, but they didn't need them. It turned out they were there. We were ready. I, you know the expression? They have an expression, ready, willing, and able. We were ready, willing, and able. What the Army Corps of Engineers did was a miracle. What, what FEMA did was a miracle. What the doctors did. So I got a call two days ago from uh, the mayor of New York. He said, could you help us even more with medical personnel? And we sent, uh, I think it was 448 doctors, nurses, and respiratory experts, real experts. And I got a call from the mayor, and he said, I want to tell you, incredible, these people are incredible. He said, they lifted the spirits of the hospital workers from New York City like nothing I've ever seen. He, he was unbelievable, what he said, it was really appreciated. And I let them know that. I let the military people. He said, they went in there so brave, so incredible. They lifted the spirits of everybody. We did all of this work. But when you read the phony stories, you, nobody, nobody acknowledges this. And it doesn't have to be acknowledged from my standpoint, but it does have to be acknowledged from the great work that these doctors, nurses, the Army Corps of Engineers, FEMA, all these people, they've done this incredible job. And they shouldn't be abused, because you take a look at what's happened. Nobody's asking for ventilators, except outside of our country. Outside of our country, they're calling me every country. They're calling me so many countries. And I'm going to try and help them, because we have thousands of ventilators being built. But nobody's asking for ventilators. Nobody's asking for beds, because we built hospitals. I think we built 20,000 beds in a period of a couple of weeks. The job they've done is incredible. With all of that being said, I'm getting along very well with the governors. And if I wouldn't, Mike Pence had a call today with the governors, and it was like a 10. I said, how was it? He said, it's a 10. He used one of my expressions, actually. But he said it was like a 10. And I'm sure you people were probably on the call, although you weren't supposed to be. But you were sitting in somebody's office listening to it, because every time we have these, and you know, and you would know that for weeks those calls have been very good. But there wasn't. Uh, a raised voice. There wasn't even a statement of, like, we think you should do this or that. I heard it was, like, a, just a perfect phone call. Uh, it might not be reported that way. They'll say, I thought that somebody maybe slightly raised, didn't even raise a voice. My only, my only point of saying this, because I want to get back to why we're here. Uh, the press has not treated these incredible people who've done such a great job. They haven't treated them fairly. They're way off. We were way ahead of schedule. And remember this, because the time story was a fake, but everything, remember this, everything we did, I was criticized because I was too early. If I waited longer, it would have been 
you would have been criti if I went way early, if I went three months earlier, I would have been criticized, you know, criticized for being way too early. So with all of that being said, we understand it. Uh, I think I've educated a lot of people as to the press. And I would love to be able to say that we have a very honest press. Honestly, John, there'd be nothing I would be more proud of if the press would work. And I don't mind being criticized, but not when they're wrong. Not when people have done a great job. Yes. Let me just ask you about the video, because I've never this seen a video like that included in, uh, in this room. The image assessment uh, it looks a, a bit like a campaign ad. Who, who produced that video for you? Uh, that was done by a group in the office, and it was done just by, we just put some clips together. I could give you, uh, I'll bet you I have over 100 more clips, even better than them. They were just pieced together over the last two hours. That was just, oh, we have far better than that. That's nothing compared to some of them. This was produced here in the White House. Yeah, by, this uh, was done by uh, Dan and a group of people, and they just put it together in a period of probably less than two hours. Why do you feel need to do that? Because uh, we're getting fake news, and I like to have it corrected. Uh, they're saying what a great job we're doing. And the media, these are the governors of California, governor of New Jersey, governor of New York. Look, in New York, we work very close with Andrew. In New York, Ventilators were going to be a problem. We, we didn't, they didn't have a problem. We got them tremendous numbers of thousands, but we got them tremendous number of ventilators. You don't hear ventilators are a problem. Beds were going to be a problem. I mean, I'm happy about it. The Javits Center, which is incredible, is almost empty because they don't need them. That's good news, not bad news. I, you know, I'm not saying, gee, I wish more people were there. I don't want more people there. We brought in the boat. We brought in the comfort. And the comfort was originally not supposed to be for this at all. The coronavirus, we're not supposed to be for that at all. They called, they said, could we have it? That was a number of weeks ago. We said, we don't think you need it, but if you need it, we'll do it. Then they said, could you get the medical personnel to run the Javits Center? Could you get the medical personnel to run the ship? We said, if it's necessary, we will, and we did. We, there were military personnel. That's the ones that Mayor de Blasio was so great to in terms of his statements. I mean, I really appreciated his statements. He was so impressed with them, and I am, too. The level of, of uh, genius and bravery, they're great people, the military people. And we pieced that together. I would say it took less than two hours. It was done in-house, Steve. But, but just to be clear, this was produced by government employees, by, by people here at the White House, this campaign-style I, I would use the here. word produced. All they did was took some clips, and they just ran them for you. And the reason they did is to keep you honest. Now, I don't think that's going to work. It's not going to have any impact. But just think of it. You heard the clips. You heard what I said. They said, I acted late on closing down the country. Uh, some people wish we never closed it down. Now, if we didn't, we would have lost hundreds of thousands of people. You know, interestingly, so I'm, I'm against it. We did the right thing. Everything we did was right. If we would have you closed down. You mistakes along the way here. You think everything you did was uh, right. Well, look. Uh, governors should have had ventilators. They chose not to have them. We were able to get them ventilators. You haven't heard, other than, you know, there was a lot of panic, a lot of screaming. We want ventilators. They got the ventilators. You don't have that anymore. And the surge is supposed to be coming now. And if they do need ventilators, John, we've got almost 10,000 that are ready to rock. We have people standing with those ventilators right now. If you needed 2,000, in New York, which you don't, but if you did, we can have them here in less than 24 hours. We're ready to rock. Well, this was a great, this was a great military and beyond that operation. Let's get back to the regular. Well, shouldn't we get back to the regular? We could talk about this, but all I'm doing is this. I could have given you like those are four or five clips that we just played for you. I could have given you hundreds of people. I mean, Gavin was on television two days ago with one of your competitors singing prayer. He says, look, you know, the question was asked in a negative way. He said, look, I know what you want to say, but want me to say, but he's been really good. It's hard for me to say that. In fact, it's impossible for me to say it. Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. Right. Uh, I have many clips from many. I have some clips from Anthony that I didn't want to put up, which were really good. I think Anthony would be the first one to say, when I closed the country to China, when I closed the, the China ban, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Anthony said, I saved a lot of lives by doing that. I mean, am I correct? I, I don't want to put words in Anthony's mouth, by the way, and I like him. Today I walk in, I hear I'm going to fire him. I'm not firing him. I think he's a wonderful guy. Why did you tweet something that said fire Fauci? Why did you fire Fauci? 
I retweeted somebody. I don't know. They said fire. Doesn't matter. Did you notice that when you retweeted yeah, it? Yeah, I, I noticed everything. So you retweeted it even though it said time to fire. No, Belgium. no, that's somebody's opinion. All that is is an opinion. Read it and you elevated No, it. I was called about that. I said I'm not firing. In fact, if you ask your friends in the office, in the public relations office, I was immediately called upon that, and I said no, I like him. I think he's terrific because this was a person's view. Not everybody's happy with Anthony. Not everybody's happy with everybody. But I will tell you, we have done a job the likes of which nobody's ever done. The mobilization, getting of equipment, all of the things we've done. Nobody's ever done a job like this. We have 50 governors and territories, by the way. People don't ever mention that. We have territories. We have 50 governors and territories. And many of those governors are Democrats. And they can't find anything to complain about. And honestly, many of them didn't do their jobs. I'll let you know someday. Let's see what happens. But I may let you know who's not doing their job. I can tell you the ones that are good, both Republican and Democrat, and the ones who don't know what they're doing. But we help some of the ones that don't know what they're doing. They should have had their own stockpiles. And now, if they want, we can build them stockpiles of ventilators. The hardest thing is a ventilator, because it's expensive. It takes a while to get. We got them, and nobody believed we did. Now, many of the governors were asking for far too many. And we said they were asking for far too many. We talked, and we said, you said very strongly that they just don't need that many. You said they don't need that many beds, Deborah. So that's it. Steve, go ahead. You and Dr. Fauci are on the same page. Yeah, we have been from the beginning. I don't know what it is exactly. But if I put somebody's opinion up, you know, I don't mind controversy. I think controversy is a good thing, not a bad thing. But I want it to be honest controversy. Now, when I got a call, I got a call not very quickly, and nobody, you know, saw that as being any big deal. They said, how are you doing with Dr. Fauci? I said, I'm doing great. And I didn't talk to Dr. Fauci even until we just got here. Dr. Fauci asked one of the people if he could get up and speak. And he did. So he said that and they the totally misinterpreted him. I saw what they did. Can, can I ask you, he said the question was hypothetical. But what he was just acknowledging is that lives would have been saved if the, if the mitigation practices were put into place earlier. That seems obvious. Do you not agree with that? Here's the thing. Now, now, what he really is saying, though, but how could you have done it? Look, I just went over stats with you. Right here, right here. How do you close it up? You have no deaths and no cases on January 11th. Uh, Doctor, would you recommend closing the United States of America? Oh, this must be terrible. How many cases do we have? None. How many deaths do we have? None. January 17th, go back another week. On January 17th, this is 10 days before I did the, a little bit less than 10 days before I did the ban. I did a ban on China. You think that was easy? I then did a ban on Europe. And a lot of people said that was an incredible thing to do, because you look at Spain. And by the way, uh, we're doing very well, because when you look at all of those flat graphs and you add it all up, the United States is very low. And per capita, we're very low. We're doing very well. But how do you close up the United States of America? So on January 6th, no deaths. On January 11th, no deaths. And no, no cases. On January 17th, no cases, no cases, no deaths. I'm supposed to close up the United States of America when I have no cases. You didn't close it down in the middle of March. Should you have closed it down earlier? I closed it down question. from China. From Excuse me. I closed it down from China. And by the way, some people think I should have waited longer and maybe ridden it out. I disagree with them, OK? But it was thought of. I mean, that was an alternative. You know, there are a lot of people that would have said, let's write it out. Now, I'll give you the, the, the good news. If I would have done that, it would have been I think catastrophic, because their numbers are, Anthony, 1.6 to 2.2 million people would have died if we tried to do that. And I did this last time. Cut it in half. Don't say 2.2 million. Cut it in more than half. Say a million people died. Well, that's much more than the Civil War. Cut it in half. Take the million and cut it in half. That's 500,000 people would have died. Now, that number we would have reached, OK? That would have been easy to reach if we did nothing. So we did the right thing. And our timing was very good. But here's the one thing, and you have to say this. When you ask me, why didn't you do this? How come when I did the ban on China and some very, very instituted some very tough things, how come Nancy Pelosi, a month later, is in Chinatown saying, let's all march. This is not going to happen. 
How come we have many of the experts from CNN and many other networks, if you call CNN a network, I don't personally, but we have CNN, we have many other places, and they're all saying, he doesn't need to do it. He doesn't need to do it. All I'm saying is this, how do you close down the greatest economy in the history of the world when on January 17th, you have no cases and no death? When on January 21st, you have one case and no death. One case, think of that. Now, we're supposed to close down the country, but here's what happened. When on January 31st, I instituted the ban, Joe Biden went crazy. He said, you don't need the ban. You, he didn't go crazy. Look, he just, he didn't even know what the hell the ban was. But he, so he didn't go crazy. You're but he did say, he did what call me xenophobic. Wait a minute. He called me xenophobic. Mm -hmm. He called me a racist. Because he has since apologized and he said I did the right thing. So when you say, why didn't you this? Every Democrat thought I made a mistake when I did it. I saved tens of thousands, maybe hundreds well, of thousands of lives that by time hurting. that you bought. The argument is that you bought yourself some time. You didn't use it to prepare hospitals. You didn't use it to ramp up testing. Right you're so, now, you're so, you're so disgraceful. It's so tens disgraceful the way you say that. Let, let me just listen. Dead. I just went over, over it. Or this ramp supposed to make people I just went over in it. an unprecedented crisis. Nobody thought we should do it, and when I did it. But what did you do with the time that you bought? You know the we month did? of February. That, you that know video we did? Was a gap. What do you do? What do you do when you have no case in the whole United States? You had cases when in you, you excuse me, you reported it. Zero cases, zero deaths on January 17th. January, February, the entire January. Month of February. I said in January. Your video has a complete gap. On January 30th. What did your administration do in February with the time that your travel ban bought? A lot. What? A lot. And in fact, we'll give you a list. What we did, in fact, part of it was up there. It we did a lot. A look, look. You know you're a fake. You know that your whole network, the way you cover it, is fake. And most of you, and not all of you. But the people are wise to you. That's why you have a lower a lower approval rating than you've ever had before, times probably three. And when you ask me that question, let me ask you this: Why didn't Biden? Why didn't? Why did Biden apologize? Why did he write a letter of apology? No, that's very important. Why did the Democrats think that I acted too quickly? You know why? Because they really thought that I acted too quickly. We have done a great job. Now I could have, I could have kept it open. And I could have done what some countries are doing. They're getting beat up pretty badly. I could have kept it open. I thought of keeping it open, because nobody's ever heard of closing down a country, let alone the United States of America. But if I would have done that, we would have had hundreds of thousands of people that would right now be dead. We've done this right, and we, we really, we really have done this right. The problem is the press doesn't cover it the way it should be. Go ahead. One more question, Steve. Go ahead. There's a debate over what authority you have to order the country reopened. Uh, what authority do you well, have? Well, I have the ultimate authority, but we're going to get into that in a minute. We're going to just finish this up. We're going to tell you about other things that we've done right. Uh, but I will say this. Had we said, let's just keep going and let's not do a closing, whether it's 2.2 that they at one point predicted as an outside or 1.6 at a lower number, uh, you cut it all the way down to six or seven or eight hundred thousand. Take just a fraction of the number that could have happened. Uh, it literally would have been more than the Civil War. It would have been a disaster. So the minimal number was a hundred thousand, and I think I feel pretty good that we're going to be substantially below Anthony the hundred thousand, and I hope we will. All right. So today, the Department of Health and Human Services is announcing five new contracts to procure large numbers of additional ventilators under the Defense Production Act, which we used a lot, by the way, which you didn't like to talk about, in addition to the 1,300 we received today. We received today 1,300 additional ventilators. Now, we're probably not going to need them, but we can add that to our stockpile, which is very big, and we can move it around should the surge take place and should it be a very substantial surge. We're ready to, we're ready to rock. The contracts are with General Electric, Hillrom, Medtronic, ResMed, and Viair, combined with the DPA contracts that we announced last week with General Motors and Philips, and two other contracts with Hamilton and Zoll. We're adding 6,190 ventilators to the strategic national stockpile, of which we have a lot already, thousands, close to 10,000. 
but this will be added by May 8th, another 29,000 by the end of May, and more than 120,000 total we will have by uh, the end of the year. Now, we're going to help other countries. We're going to help states if they need it. We may help some states stockpile. You know, they're supposed to buy their own stockpile. They have state stockpiles. They're supposed to be using that. And unfortunately, most of the states weren't there. And, and a lot of people didn't want to talk about it, but they weren't there. Uh, we will talk about it at the right time, if you want to. I, I at this point, uh, I'm more focused on getting past this nightmare of a epidemic or a pandemic, anything you want to call it. We got to get past it. No one who has needed a ventilator has not gotten a ventilator. Think of that. You know, you heard all about ventilators, ventilators. We need ventilators because they didn't have them, because the state should have had them. No one who has needed a ventilator has not gotten a ventilator. No one who has needed a hospital bed has been denied a hospital bed. That's not even really our responsibility. Now, if we can help, we're going to do it. But that's where the Army Corps of Engineers did such a great job. We built over 20,000 beds. In fact, we built thousands more than we've actually needed to be safe. We wanted to be safe, and we really, they rose to this incredible occasion. I mean, we built uh, more beds than we thought. We thought in Louisiana we were going heavy. And again, when I called the governor, I said, maybe we shouldn't build that second hospital, because we don't want to build it if you don't need it. He called back. He said, I don't think we're going to need it. Uh, they had a 1,000 rooms, a 1,000 beds. And uh, they used a lot of them, but they didn't need the other one, so we stopped it, because we don't want to waste. But we're prepared to build thousands more should we need it. I don't think we're going to need it, because it looks like we're plateauing, and maybe even, in many cases, coming down. In addition, we've ordered a total of 60 mobile decontamination contamination systems. So the decontamination uh, system uh, from Batilin Ohio is an incredible thing because it takes the masks and up to 20 times you can decontaminate a mask. And uh, I've been asking from the beginning, why can't we sterilize or sanitize these masks? And it turned out we can. And there was a great company in Ohio. They sent us some great equipment, and they're doing that now. Uh, and now we're going to have more than 33 million N95 masks per week will be cleaned, decontaminated, and it'll be great. It's something that, frankly, I think people should have thought of a long time ago. Five more flights landed today as part of the Project Airbridge, our massive airlift lift operation to bring uh, personal protective equipment into the United States, which has now delivered nearly half a million N95 masks, 370 million gloves, 25 million surgical masks, and four pint 0.9 million gowns. So we have millions of gowns, gloves, masks, all surgical equipment coming in should the states need it. Now, the, sa the states are supposed to be buying their own stuff, but should they need it, we are ready to give them because we're building up our stockpile again like crazy. Remember, I, I and you saw the stories, I inherited this administration, Mike, myself, the whole administration, we inherited uh, a stockpile where the cupboards were bare. There was nothing. And I say it, and I'll say it again, just like we didn't have ammunition, we didn't have medical supplies, we didn't have ventilators, we didn't have a lot of things that should have been had. And you can read your own stories on that, because you know what happened. They didn't want to spend the money. But we did. To date, we've facilitated the supply of more than 38 million N95 masks nationwide. This week, we'll be sending 2 million N95 masks to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The Vice President will go into more detail. He's got great detail on that, and I think it's a pretty amazing story. We have a lot of masks already in stock, and we have more coming. We're further expanding hospital surge capacity in key areas of the opening, and we have uh, a portion of certain VA hospitals and non-veteran coronavirus patients, including at the East Orange, New Jersey Medical Center, as well as facilities in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Uh, they're ready. They're able. They're beautiful. Uh, hopefully, we won't need too many of them, because, frankly, we built uh, everything that the governors wanted, and in many cases, it's too much. We told them it was too much, but we wanted to err on the side of caution. The United States has now conducted nearly 3 million tests for the virus, 3 million, the most of any nation. We are performing approximately 115,000 tests every single day, and our rate of testing is especially high in areas hardest hit by the virus. If you look, and that's really, and it's hit some areas, the virus, very, very hard. For example, per capita testing in New York is higher than the rest of the world. 
The NIH, CDC, and FDA are also currently validating several antibody tests that will allow us to determine whether someone has already had the virus and potentially become immune to infection. We're looking at that. The antibody tests are uh, going to be very interesting over the next short while. A lot of things are being developed as we speak. In the race to develop effective treatments, the drug company Gilead announced that its drug, Remdesivir, has shown promising results, very promising, in compassionate use settings. In addition, the FDA has just granted emergency use authorization for a device that removes certain proteins from the bloodstream, possibly preventing a patient's immune system from overreacting to the virus and damaging vital organs, which is a big problem. Furthermore, over the last seven days, my administration has deployed roughly 28 million doses of hydroxychloroquine from our national stockpile. We have uh, millions of doses that we bought, and many people are using it all over the country. And just recently, uh, uh, a friend of mine told me he got better because of the use of that, that drug. So who knows? And you combine it with z -Pak, you combine it with zinc, uh, depending on your doctor's recommendation, and it's having some very good results, I'll tell you. So think if anybody recommended it other than me, it would be used all over the place, to be honest with you. I think the fact that I recommended it, I probably said it back a lot. But it's a lot of good things are happening with it, a lot of good tests. Scientists are also pursuing a blood therapy known as uh, convalescent plasma. Convalescent plasma. This therapy uses antibodies from the blood of recovered patients to treat those who are sick. And this is something that actually is a very old procedure, but it's done in a very modern way. During this difficult time, we're also working to ensure that the 2020 census is completed safely and accuracy. We may be asking for an extension because, obviously, uh, they can't be doing very much right now. Uh, they wouldn't even be allowed to do it. So the census, we're going to be asking for a, uh, a delay, a major delay. I think, how can you possibly be knocking on doors for a long period of time now? The Census Bureau recently made the decision to temporarily suspend its field operation data collection activities to help stop the spread. In addition, while millions of Americans continue to complete their questionnaire online, the Census Bureau has asked Congress for a 120 extension. I don't know that you even have to ask them. This is called an act of God. This is called a, uh, a situation that has to be uh, they have to give, and I think 120 days isn't nearly enough. My administration is also taking bold action to help American workers. On Friday, Americans began receiving the cash payments authorized by a historic $2 trillion relief bill. By the end of the week, nearly 80 million Americans will receive a total of $147 billion. And from what the Secretary of the Treasury tells me, that's very much on time and going very nicely. He'll be speaking in a moment. In payments, uh, these payments go directly into the banks and the bank accounts of these people. Millions of additional payments will follow. The typical family of four will receive $3,400. That's for a family of four. That's something. Additionally, through our Paycheck Protection Program, which is a tremendous success, and they should extend it and uh, increase it. This has been a tremendous success. Uh, so successful that the banks are taking a little bit longer to distribute the money, but it's going rapidly. We've now processed over $200 billion in loans to help small businesses retain their workers. Now we urgently need lawmakers to set aside the partisan agendas and to replenish this program with new funds, because it's really something that has been an incredible success. And uh, they need uh, more money to keep it going to take care of these businesses and keep, an keep them open. I want to thank the many governors, health professionals, scientists, and business leaders for their incredible hard work and input over the past month, and even long beyond a month, Mike, I would say. You know, so we've been working together with a lot of them for, it seems like, forever. I've been having many discussions with my team and top experts, and we're very close to completing a plan to open our country, hopefully even ahead of schedule. And that's so important. We will soon finalize new and very important guidelines to give governors the information they need to start safely opening their states. My administration's plan and corresponding guidelines will give the American people the confidence they need to begin returning to normal life. That's what we want. We want to have our country open. We want to return to normal life. Our country is going to be open, and it's going to be successfully opened. And we'll be explaining over a very short 
number of days exactly what is going to be. Uh, we've also, uh, as you probably heard, uh, developed a committee. Uh, we're actually calling it a number of committees with the most prominent people in the country, the most successful people in the various fields, and we'll be announcing them tomorrow. This weekend, the United States also helped facilitate an unprecedented agreement among the 23 nations of OPEC Plus. That's OPEC Plus additional energy producing nations, representing many of the world's largest oil producing countries to stabilize oil markets. And we have, in fact, and I think you've seen a big stabilization over the last couple of days. Together, countries around the world will cut oil production by approximately 20 million barrels. Uh, people are saying 10 million, but we think that the number that they'll actually hit uh, is going to be closer to 20 million barrels a day, and that will help a lot with saving jobs all over Texas and Oklahoma and uh, North Dakota and many of other, other of our big energy states. This historic action will help nearly 11 million American workers who are supported by the U.S. oil and gas industry. It's a very monumental uh, agreement. I want to thank Saudi Arabia and the King of Saudi Arabia and Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, both. I want to thank President Putin of Russia, and I want to thank a very good friend of mine, man who's become a friend of mine. The President of Mexico showed great flexibility, President Lopez Obrador. He showed great flexibility uh, and, uh, and tremendous intelligence doing what he did. It was not that easy for him. And I want to thank Mexico and the President. Uh, this is a very historic deal, very historic. So we'll see how it all goes. Uh, in this time and challenge, uh, and we are certainly in a time probably like we haven't been in many, many decades, we are strengthened and sustained by the bonds of love and loyalty that unite all Americans. I'm so proud of the American people. Everywhere you look, you see the patriotism of our people shining through and the courage of our doctors and nurses on the front lines, in the dedication of our food supply workers, and in the commitment of every citizen to achieving victory over the virus. That's what's going to happen. It's going to happen sooner than people think, and we're going to be smart about it, very, very smart about it. We're going to be safe about it. We're going to be listening also to the great doctors and medical professionals. Together, we're beating back the invisible enemy, and we're paving the way for great resurgence, really a great resurgence for American prosperity. Uh, our country wants to go back. They want to go back to work. They're going to go back safely, and that's what we want. I'd like now to ask uh, Vice President Pence to say a few words, uh, followed by Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks. Uh, I think before we uh, before we do this, because I know there's an emergency uh, where they want Steve to come. So what I'll do is I'll ask uh, Steve to come up, Secretary of the Treasury. You can talk a little bit and then maybe take a couple of questions about what's happening. Tell them the success we're having. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President and Mr. Vice President. Uh, as you announced, we are very pleased that we are ahead of schedule on delivering the economic impact payments. These were what was known as the checks in the mail uh, that we want to deliver in direct, direct deposit. Uh, this is ahead of schedule. We started processing those last Friday. Uh, we expect that over 80 million hardworking Americans will get the direct deposit by this Wednesday. And we know how important that is to all of those hardworking Americans, many of which are at home not working at the moment. Uh, if you do not receive them by Wednesday, on Wednesday we will be launching at irs.gov. Click on irs.gov, go to get your payment. Uh, if you filed a tax return in 2018 and 19, or 19, have that information available. You'll be able to ID yourself. You'll be able to put in your direct deposit information. And within several days, we will automatically deposit the money into your account. We want to do as much of this electronically as we can. It's very important in this day and age. It's more secure, and you don't have to go to the bank. If you are a Social Security beneficiary, you do not need to do anything. You will get a direct deposit. If you have not filed and did not need to file a 2018 and 19 return, you can go to irs.gov now and enter your information and authenticate yourself. So again, we are very pleased that that is ahead of schedule. Um, I'd also like to announce the progress we're making on the new SBA program, the PPP. Let me just remind everybody, this is a brand new program that is now one week old. 
We have distributed uh, and, and confirmed 230 billion of loans to over 4,600 lenders participating. That is multiples and multiples of anything that the SBA has ever done in, in one year before. And I especially want to thank the broad-based community banks that are participating. Again, over 4,600 banks. If you haven't had your loan processed, uh, you will get it processed this week. As the President said, we've gone back to Congress and asked them for more money to make sure that every business has access to this. Uh, let me also comment for the states. Uh, we are distributing out half the money this week to the states. That's a week ahead of time. And we'll deliver the other half of the money to the states next week. And then let me just finally comment, we've been very, working very closely with the Federal Reserve. Last week we announced expanded facilities and new facilities that total $2.3 trillion of liquidity. And in particular, I'd just like to highlight a Main Street lending facility that will be for companies between one worker and 10,000 people, so mid-sized businesses, and also a municipal facility for states and local governments to be able to access funds given the shortages that they have. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Do you questions. have any questions to state, please? Secretary Mason. Thank you, sir. Um, both uh, Speaker Pelosi and Minority Leader Schumer have said that they're in negotiations with you right now on additional funding for these small business loans, the, the, that package. Uh, Leader McConnell, though, has said that nothing should be added to the package that should just be specific to small business loans. Uh, what is the opinion uh, of your administration? Should there be some sort of horse trading here, or should it just be small business loans? Well, the, the President's view and the Vice President's, in my view, is this was a bipartisan program. This SBA program, it wasn't a Republican program, it wasn't a Democrat program, it was a bipartisan program. We've committed to small businesses. We should top up that program now. I know the Democrats want to talk about more money for hospitals and states. Right now, we're just sending the money out to the hospitals and states. They haven't come close to using that money. And I know the President and Vice President have said, once we get the SBA done, we can go into another funding bill. The President's talked about potentially adding infrastructure and other things. We think there is a likelihood we will need more money, and we will, we will sit down and try to get a bipartisan bill. But this is important we deliver on small businesses, 50 percent of the people work for small businesses. Thank you, sir. What's the emergency that the president said you had to go for? The president said you, you had an emergency negotiation over this bill? Yeah, well, yes. we're, because we don't want to run out of money. We've used about $220 billion of the $350 billion. We don't want to run out of that money. Uh, we don't want to create panics that people won't get it. So that's why we want to we want to top that up, and we've asked for another 250 billion for that program. And again, let me just remind you: every dollar we spend in this program, we save a dollar of unemployment insurance. So even though we're asking for 250 billion, it really won't cost that much. Could I follow up? What are your, do you have concerns about uh, lifting the guidelines too soon? I mean, what's the economic impact? I understand the economic argument for getting people back to work, obviously, but what's the economic risk of lifting them too early and seeing a uh, than a spike in cases well, again. Well, of course, there's economic risks in both directions. We reviewed with the president today uh, a very broad list of over 100 business people uh, that are going to help advise the president on what needs to be done to reopen the economy. We want to make sure, and again, the combination of economic impact payments, small business payments, enhanced unemployment insurance, the president made very clear we want to make sure that hardworking Americans have liquidity while we wait to reopen the government. So do you believe the government should be reopened, or the country, excuse me, should be reopened on May 1? Uh, I've had discussions with the president. I know he's considering it, and I believe he's going to make a decision deal. later in the week. Everything has to be safe. What we is your safe. advice to the president? My advice is as soon as it's ready to open and based upon the medical professionals, and, and again, we're working very closely with the president and outside business leaders to develop a plan. I'm just wondering, I'm asking Mr. President, what do you think, what could, if you could sketch for us what reopening the economy looks like? Do you think it's going to be everything open, or do you we'll think... We'll doing that over the next few days, because we'll probably be making a statement about that and exactly what it looks like. I know what that looks like, but I also want to get uh, the advice, in a sense. We have some of the... Uh, the biggest from every business on this uh, council. We're actually setting up a number of different councils or committees, I guess you could call them. And we have a lot of smart people 
uh, I think that they will give us some also good advice. But no, we want to be very, very safe. At the same time, we got to get our country open. So yeah, and I understand that, Mr. President. Do you think there is a possibility then that what you do is you open it incrementally? Do you think people will go back to restaurants, to concerts, the cinema? I do think so. Eventually they will. Yeah. And uh, 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 let me ask I, one I think eventually they will do that. And I think we're going to, boom, I think we're going to, I think it's going to go quickly. Our people want to get back to work, and I think there's a pent-up demand like there hasn't been in a long time. Yeah. And, that's why, and that's why you see the stock market, I mean, to think that the stock market's at the level it is right now with all that this world and this country has gone. And look at the European Union, how badly decimated they've been. Look at other countries. Look at China, by the way. I've seen the numbers. Look at China. Look at how these countries have been just decimated by this. And to think that the stock market is at this tremendously high number, not that much. You know, it was looking a little bleak for a while, but it, it hit a certain point and then started going up. I think that's a great tribute to the fact that there's a demand. Yeah. Mr. President, thank you, sir. Um, in regards to some of your, your tweets earlier today, and I think it was Steve's question, um, my question to you is what provision in the Constitution gives the President the power to open or close state economies? Uh, and then... Numerous uh, provisions will give you a legal brief if you want. And then, and then um, we'll be looking forward to that, sir. Uh, but following up, what happens if you say, for instance, uh, we want states to reopen, but California or New York do not open? What would you do well, then? I think everybody wants to open. I mean... So I just ask one I guess, other thing. You know, that could happen, but I don't think that would happen. states that have closed, ordered schools closed. It's been states that have ordered businesses like restaurants. That's because I let that happen. Because I would have preferred that. I let that happen. But if I wanted to, I could have closed it up. But I let that happen. And I like the way they've done it. And the seven that remained really in sort of a semi-lockdown, if you look at those states, they've really done a very good job. They're very much different from a New York or from other places where they've been hit very hard. So you're yes. prepared to take states and say, I order you to open your schools, I order you to force ahead, kids please. to be able yeah. to go? Yes, Mr. President. Following up on that, uh, there are two consortiums of states today, California, Oregon, Washington on the West Coast, northeastern states, totally representing about 100 million people, who said they're going to cooperate and decide when to reopen. Well, they can decide, states. but... Does that uh, undermine what you're trying no, to do? No, not at all. No. Let, let, let me just tell you, very simple. I'm going to put it very simply. The President of the United States has the authority to do what the President has the authority to do, which is very powerful. The President of the United States calls the shots. If we weren't here for the states, you would have had a problem in this country like you've never seen before. We were here to back them up, and we back and we've more than backed them up. We did a job that nobody ever thought was possible. It's a decision for the President of the United States. Now, with that being said, we're going to work with the states because it's very important. You have local governments. They're pinpointed. It's really, you talk about, it's a, like a microchip. They're pinpointed. We have local government that hopefully will do a good job. And if they don't do a good job, I'd step in so fast. But no, they can't do anything without the approval of the President of the United States. Go ahead, please. So if, if some states refuse to reopen and you order them to, the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution says all powers that don't reside in the President of the Congress reside in the states. How do you overcome Well, if some states to refuse to open, I would be — I would like to see that person run for election. Uh, they're going to open. They're going to all open. The ballot box. I, I think that's something that's not going to happen. They want to open. They have to open. They have to get open. Every one of those states, the people want to go and they want to. Now, some will be are in a different situation. You have, I won't name states now, but I will over the next two or three days. I'm going to be very specific. But you have some states where this is not the kind of a problem that it is in New York or Louisiana or Michigan or other places that got hit very hard. Illinois got hit very hard. Uh, but all states want to open, and they want to open as soon as possible. But they want to open safely, and so do I. Yeah, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Today, the French President Emmanuel Macron said that he will keep the shutdown in France till the middle of May. Does that mean that the U.S. will keep the ban? No, France got hit very Europe? hard. France got hit very hard. And again, he has to do what he has to do. He's a friend of mine. Uh, but France, Spain has just been decimated. You look at what's happened in Italy, it's a very well known fact what happened in Italy. No, they were hit very hard. Uh, 
question for Secretary Mnuchin. Um, has everybody that you would like to have, the 100 business people on the um, Economic Council, have they all been invited already? Have they all agreed? They, to have, they haven't been invited yet. We just reviewed the names with the president today. And are they from all on. sectors? Yes, there's, basically there's vertical. So every single area of the economy we wanted to be represented. Great. One other thing. Is there anything else needs to be done to to work on industry, uh, oil industry jobs, to save oil industry jobs after the, the deal this past weekend? Well, I think there's always things. So we're working with Larry Kudlow. I mean, we, we have, we have we economic done. plans for every single part of the economy. Obviously, in the case of the oil industry, they've been hit especially hard because you've had both the, the supply issue and you've had the demand issue. Have you, uh, have you figured out the bailout money for the airlines, the allocations for the airlines? So um, I'm pleased to say we've worked very hard. Uh, I think, as you probably have seen, we put out a press release that we have now had discussions with almost all the airlines. I've personally had discussions with all the major airline CEOs. Uh, we specifically created an exception for small airlines that we could process very quickly, and I, I think you'll see very quickly uh, decisions coming out. I'm very pleased with the discussions we've had. We've had very good discussions. Secretary, yes. do you see a need for a phase four stimulus, or is this? Steve, I just want to say we have had discussions. Wait, excuse me one second. We've had very good discussions with the airlines. Very good discussions. Is it possible to reopen the economy on May the 1st? I don't want to say that. You'll be hearing over the next few days. Do you still see a need for a phase four? Is this push in lieu of another stimulus? Okay, so again, let me just comment. I mean, Congress on a bipartisan basis approved an unprecedented amount of money to help American workers and American business because it was no fault of their own that business was closed down. We, we have been very diligently executing on that. You know, everybody said it was going to take months to get people money. We are executing very quickly. We created a whole new SBA program in a week. Our job right now is to execute the $2.3 billion, which we can add several trillion dollars with the Fed. The one area we are particularly concerned about is the small business program. Quite frankly, it's even more incredibly popular and successful than we anticipated. So the president wants to be very clear we have money for that. And once we get done with that, we will review with the president. If there is more money that needs to be to support this economy, to support hardworking Americans, we will work with Congress to get that and done. And Steve, do you want to talk about phase four? So phase four, the president has, has talked about infrastructure for a long period of time. We've talked about uh, to the extent that the hospitals need more money because of the medical issues, we'll, we'll monitor that. We want to make sure there are incentives for restaurants, uh, entertainment, people to get back to those types of things. So we'll be looking at very specifically provisions to stimulate parts of the economy. Some of them may be money issues, some of them may be regulatory issues. Mr. President, just, just to clarify your understanding of your authority vis-a-vis -vis governors, uh, just to be very specific. For instance, if a governor issued a state home When you say my authority, the president's authority. Right. Not mine, because it's not me. This is when somebody's the president of the United States, the authority is total. And that's the way it's got to be. Total. Your authority is total. It's total. It's total. Your and the governors total. know that. So if a, if a the governors know that. Governor now you have a couple of bands of, of excuse me, you just, excuse me. You have a couple. Send, uh, could you rescind that order? You have a couple of bands of uh, of uh, Democrat governors, but they will agree to it. What they will agree to it. But uh, the authority of the President of the United States having to do with the subject we're talking about is total. Hey, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, do you agree with that? Yeah, please, go ahead. Mr. President's authority is total. One of the things you've spoke, we saw in your video about was the travel ban from Europe. Um, as part of reopening America, do you want to reopen the borders so that people from Europe, from the UK... At the right time. How soon yeah, very Good question, actually. Well, I'm going to have to take a look. I wouldn't say Italy's doing great right now, and I wouldn't say Spain's doing great right now. And uh, we just heard that France is extending its uh, stay inside order, right? They've extended it. I just see that. And uh, I think for a short period of time. But no, when they're back, we want to do it very quickly, but we want to make sure everything's good. No, right now we have a very, right now we have a very strong ban. We're going to keep it that way until they heal. 
weeks, months? What would you well, like? I can't tell you that. I have to see. How are they doing? I mean, France just went for another two days, for another two weeks. We have to see, John. So Dr. Fauci said that you took his advice on the question of mitigation. He made the recommendation. You accepted it. You put it into place. As you make this next decision, which, well, as I'm not you sure said, who, who, John, I'm not sure who really uh, gave me advice on the band. I think I took, band, I think I took my own advice on the, the band. The, the, social, the social distancing I'm talking about, the shutting down, okay. not, not of travel, but, but, of, but of activity. So my question is, as you make this next decision, which you have said may be the most difficult or important decision of your presidency, will you assure the American people that you will again take the advice of the doctors, of Dr. Fauci, of Dr. Birx? Will you take the advice of the health experts before you I do will, that? I will, and many other people also. But I will absolutely take their advice. Well, would you, go against, their, would you yes. go against their recommendation? If they say you need another 15 or 30 I don't days, think it would be would likely you? because I think we're not very far from being on the same page. Please. Yes, Mr. President, one thing that Governor Cuomo said today is that states do not have the capacity to do mass COVID-19 testing ahead of a reopening. Well, they have to do it. Look, he says supposed he can't to be purchase the diagnostic tests yeah. or equipment and needs federal help. Well, so they, will the they may need help, but, will they get but they're there. They're on ground. They've got local mayors, local representatives. They have but people that do supplies. it. And what? we did last time is unprecedented. We literally rebuilt tests. We, we rebuilt a whole industry because we inherited nothing. What we inherited from the previous administration was totally broken, which somebody should eventually say. Not only were the cupboards bare, as I say, but we inherited broken testing. Now we have great testing. I just left the top executives at Abbott. Who would have thought that would have happened, where they have such a great test as that? And, in fact, what I'll do, I think, uh, unless you have any further questions for the Secretary of the Treasury, do you have anybody for, Steve, anybody? Is the that for the Secretary yeah. of the yes, Treasury? Sir, if, I'm I'm if it's for me, we can wait. That's for Secretary uh, We have to get him back to work, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, for Secretary Mnuchin, a question from one of my colleagues who's not able to be in the room. Um, they're curious about the SBA rule that prevents small casinos from getting um, some of, of, of this relief. Is that something that you're taking a look at? Uh, is there going to be a change to so not, 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 not small casinos, but there are such things as small taverns and restaurants that have literally, you know, small gaming things. And, and we, we are coming out with some additional guidance on that. But I want to be clear, it's not small casinos. Thanks, sir. Uh, Secretary, uh, yes. there was uh, a letter that some House Republicans sent this weekend about liquidity for mortgage servicers. Yes. Are, can you explain what you're looking at on that front? Sure. So uh, I, I think I commented on this uh, a week or so ago. We had a subcommittee task force at FSOC that specifically studied this issue. We have all the appropriate people on it. Ginny May has automatically taken some action. Uh, we've had conversations with the FHFA as to what they're going to do for Fannie and Freddie. And we've said that to the extent they need certain authorities from the Treasury, we will accommodate that. So we're, we're very aware of the issue. Quite frankly, we've been studying this issue way before COVID and had concerns about some of these non-bank servicers not being well capitalized. But we're going we're to make sure that the market functions properly. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Um, we have seen in a number of these relief bills that Democrats and Republicans have been able to push forward different non-coronavirus-specific uh, funding uh, priorities. Are, are you trying to keep funding specific to coronavirus? And then if there are going to be other additions, for instance, uh, a change to labor rules is something that many on the left wanted. Some on the right are wondering if they should also, if you should also be pushing for, you know, their preferred add-ons. Uh, well, I think, I think our expectation has always been this is COVID-related. Some people have a rather broad view of what COVID-related is because it has impacted almost every single business. Um, I mean, I think we've the president has talked about the Kennedy Center, which is a good institution. Obviously, that was not the major priority of the bill, but they were hit with COVID-related. So, But no, the president has instructed we want to be very specific in the next bill. It's COVID-related items. Well, we didn't want to do the Kennedy Center, just so you understand. And that was done. The Democrats wanted it in. We didn't want that. But they wanted it in, and we had to agree in order to get something done for the workers. But we want this to be for the workers and for companies that employ the workers. That's what we're looking for. We're not looking for extraneous nonsense. It's been reported that, that you argued at the time of the, 
that China ban was being discussed, that, that that was too disruptive to the global economy. Is that accurate? Yeah, well, let me be clear. I had nothing to do with the China ban. I wasn't on the task force at the time. I'm not even sure I was. I think I was traveling at the time, but I never had any. I was not part. I, I did become very active and after the China ban. But that report in the New York Times was not accurate. Not I, I was not part of the task force at that time, and I was n I was not involved. Matter of fact, I think I may have been traveling. This is a proposal made by Senator Hawley to get direct payments to uh, employers to pay um, people who have been laid off and to keep people on payroll. Um, does the administration support that proposal? Well, again, that, that is the PPP. The PPP is basically sending money to small business, 50 percent of American workers, to keep those people paid. And it's the most efficient way. Every dollar, as I said, we do through that, it's one less dollar of unemployment. And more importantly, we want those people to have be associated with the business so as soon as the president is ready to open up the economy, those businesses are together. We don't want those businesses to fall apart. That's why this is such a successful program. But are you talking about unemployment? You're talking about the unemployment. I'm sending it indirectly to the states. We would have preferred that it was sent directly to the people. The Democrats wanted it to be sent through the unemployment system. And, you know, I've talked to you about it. We have 40-year-old equipment in many of those systems. They're run by the state. But I'm hearing they're getting the money out anyway. So some, some of them are, and some of the states aren't. And we encourage, you know, we're working with the states to try to update their computers. But it's a, it's a long haul. Okay. Thank, right. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Phase four, Steve. Phase four. Come on, Steve. A quick question about something you just said. You said when someone is president of the United States, their authority is total. That is not true. Who? who okay. You, you know what we're going to do? We're going to write up papers on this. It's not going to be necessary because the governors need us one way or the other because ultimately it comes with the federal government. That being said, we're getting along very well with the governors, and I feel very certain that uh, there won't be a problem. Has yeah, please, governor, go ahead. Has any governor agreed that you have the authority to decide when their state I haven't asked up? anybody. Because I don't, you know why? Because I don't have to. Go ahead, please. But who told you the president has the total authority? Enough. Please. You mentioned the vice president's call with the governors today. Uh, governor Hogan of Maryland has urged your administration to ask Congress for $500 billion to help stabilize budgetary shortfalls created by cor coronavirus. It's nice of Governor Hogan. Very much. We appreciate Governor Hogan's statement. Governor Cuomo said the CARES Act ignored state government Cuomo. revenue shortfalls. Do you support that request? And Mr. Which Rick one? Where is it? Uh, he said the CARES Act ignored uh, the budgetary shortfalls. Well, they're looking at things in phase four where they have, uh, you know, where they talk about states, and they're also talking about hospitals. They're talking about states who have been battered, and they're also talking about hospitals, and we're certainly willing to look at that. Will you urge Congress on their behalf? Uh, we'll, we'll see what uh, we all come back with, but they are talking about states, and they're talking about hospitals. Thank OAN. You. Thank you, Mr. President. Governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, has on Thursday signed an executive order banning the sale of non-essential goods. If other states follow non-essential goods, she has banned the sale of non-essential goods. Many are calling this draconian, unconstitutional. As president, do you think that if other states were to follow her example in the coming weeks, that the federal government should intervene? Well, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's very extreme, but uh, she's doing it, and I think it's going to be over a long way before we have to start thinking about it too much. It is strong. It's a very strong position to take. Uh, but they're making a lot of progress in Michigan, so let's see how it all works. What is the status of the funding for the World Health Organization? Uh, we're going to be talking about that very soon. I'm getting a full report. I'm not happy with the World Health Organization. Not happy with the World Trade Organization, either. We've been ripped off by everybody. We have this country for so many years has been ripped off by everybody, whether it's a world health or world trade. And they're like, I call them uh, the Bobsy twins. They look at our country. For years and years, we had people that did nothing about it. We're doing a lot about it. So we'll have a report. And we'll also, we're also talking about the World Trade Organization. But we've made a lot of progress there. We're now winning cases for the first time because they know I'll, I'll leave if we don't get treated fairly. This country, our country, was at a point where we rarely, if ever, won the lawsuits within the World Trade Organization. But now we're winning a lot of them because they know I'm not, I'm not playing games. We will pull out if we have to. We just won a $7 billion lawsuit. Do you 
which was very nice. Do you expect a decision this week on cutting funding for the uh, WHI? Yeah, I would say by the end of the week, I'm going to make a decision on that. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of, right now, there's a lot of things happening. On China? Why are there no consequences for China for the misinformation you know that they share? No shared? consequences. We have been asked today. How do you know there are no consequences? What are the consequences, Mr. President? I wouldn't the tell you. China will find out. But why would I tell you? People are concerned that they stonewall. No, you started off by saying, "Why are there no consequences?" A few times. So follow up on your response. Why are there no consequences? How do you for know China? there are no consequences? You You're going to find said, out. I wouldn't tell you. You'd probably be the last person on earth I'd tell. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Mr. President, actually, this is a question for uh, yeah. Mr. Vice President. Do you agree with the President's statement and his understanding of federalism that his power is total, right, in the way that he described it? Is there anything you'd like to add or any context you'd like to add to what he, the way he was discussing that? I, I support the President's leadership under the national emergency declaration that he signed. We're standing before you today the first time in American history when all 50 states have issued emergency declarations and the territories. This is an unprecedented time in the life of the nation. And fortunately, as presidents reflected and our health experts will continue to reflect, because the American people have heeded the president's coronavirus guidelines for America, because state governors have taken those and implemented them, even in states where there was not a significant outbreak and implemented additional measures as we provided them with data about cases and best practices. We're making real progress as a country. But it sounds like you but think his no powers are a little more it. circumscribed than total. Well, well, make no mistake about it. In the long history of this country, the authority of the President of the United States during national mm -hmm. emergencies is unquestionably plenary. And you can look back through times of war, and other national emergencies. Uh, and as the President said, we'll happily brief that. But in the days ahead, what the President has charged us to do is to work with our health experts. We're going to bring together an extraordinary group of American business leaders to counsel the President. And then working with the CDC, we're going to produce new guidelines based upon the data for every state and territory in this nation. Uh, we're going to give them guidance, and as, as the President's indicated, we'll, we'll continue to respect uh, the leadership and partnership that we forge with every governor uh, in America. But um, this is an unprecedented time. But I, I, I have to tell you, um, when you look at the fact, despite the heartbreaking loss of more than 22,000 Americans, when you look at the fact of what what the health experts told us this could be. I think I only can feel a sense of gratitude to the American people, gratitude to the extraordinary team that has counseled this president, the steps that President Trump has taken, the, the, the policies that governors have implemented all across America. I mean, we were discussing today at the task force that when you look at the European Union as a whole, they have nearly three times the mortality rate that the United States of America has today. And that is a tribute to our extraordinary health care workers, their dedication, their tireless work. But it's also a tribute to the fact that the American people put into practice the mitigation efforts that the President counseled the nation to do on the advice of our best scientists now more than a month ago. And our hospitals were not overwhelmed and are not overwhelmed at this hour. And, and I, I have to tell you, standing here today, I, I, I couldn't be more proud uh, to stand alongside this president and to be a part of this team that has served the American people during this challenging hour. And I, I just say to you, to every American looking on, as we see the numbers leveling and maybe even beginning to go down, I just encourage you to keep doing what you're doing because of the sacrifices that Americans and American families have made through these mitigation efforts. You're saving lives and you're seeing our nation through this Go time. Ahead, Sir, did the states tell you, you've been talking to the governors quite a bit, did those yes. coalitions of states on the West Coast and in the Northeast, did they tell you what they were going to be announcing before they announced it? Uh, uh, governor Phil Murphy and the governor of Connecticut expressed today that they were going to be speaking on a and discussing on a regional basis what their recommendations would be. And, 
And we assured them How's today, that, though, sir? we assured them today on our conference call with, I think, 48 governors uh, that were with us today for the better part of, of an hour and a half. Um, we told them that what the president would be producing is directed to be produced are additional guidelines for the states certified by the CDC that would inform those governors and uh, local communities and mayors about the best way forward based on the unique circumstances that those states and those communities are facing. I think what's clear is the American people have seen the experience in Washington state where this really all began for us and in California, and now the extraordinary challenges in the greater New York City area, including New Jersey and Connecticut, the challenges in New Orleans and Louisiana and Detroit, still Chicago, parts of Houston, but they're also seeing that in each one of those cases uh, that the mitigation efforts are truly working. And so we'll, we'll, work with those, we'll work with those states, and in some cases, it'll make perfect sense for them to work together you know ahead on of a time regional basis. Planning? But, we don't know that. but you the, don't president, know that. The, the president will be, that. I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. All right. Can you tell us, did they you let you know? know? No, you made a statement, you don't know that. Did the West Coast I didn't hear, I didn't hear the statement. Would, and we would like to have their cooperation, and we are going to have their cooperation. They will cooperate perfectly, watch. I, I, and let me, let me just affirm what the president said. We heard it again today in what I think was our ninth conference call with governors is I think every American would be proud to see the partnership that this president has forged with governors across the country. I mean, it is an extraordinary statement, and you'll see some data when Admiral Polovchek gets up in just a few moments. But the flow of resources from around the world that we've moved into areas that have faced challenges, I mean, this president has directed us to ensure that every state has what they need when they need it. Uh, and the spirit that I heard again from Republicans and Democrat governors today was reflective of that partnership. And as we move forward to the president's goal of reopening America, we expect the same kind of partnership in the interest of the nation. All right, go ahead. Do the new face mask. Sir, can, if you can hear me through the mask. Um, Barely. Can, can you? I hear the, you well. The District of Columbia argues that they were shortchanged in the most recent funding bill because they were treated as a territory instead of as a state. Will that be made right in phase four? Well, we're looking at that, certainly. I, I heard that complaint, but uh, the mayor seems to be very happy with everything we've she's done. I mean, she's actually, and she was on today, saying very good things. Okay, yeah, go ahead, in the back. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, you, you talked about this being the most difficult decision that you're going to have to take about whether to reopen the economy. I wonder how much it weighs on your mind the thought that if there is a second wave, you've reopened the economy and you might have to shut things down again. It does, and I hope that won't happen. I certainly hope that won't happen, but it does weigh on my mind. Okay, in the back, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mr. President? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, a question for one of my colleagues who wasn't able to be here. Um, China deployed an aircraft carrier into the South China Sea, South China Sea this weekend um, amid claims by Chinese state media that COVID has reduced U.S. military readiness in the region. Um, what kind of responses are you thinking of? Uh, will you have a response uh, to this action? Uh, China has their own difficulties. Uh, we have a... Uh, relationship with China that uh, we're not happy with certain things that happened over the last period of time, as you know, and I've been very explicit on that. Uh, but we know all about that. And no, China is uh, — uh, we've seen what they did. We've seen many other things that they've done, both pro and con, uh, and we'll be just fine. Well, I've been, I've been, I've been earlier where you said that you were putting together the, the economic task force and that you thought that the recommendations were happening earlier than expected. Did you mean to suggest that it could be before May 1st that you start recommending? I don't want to say that, but we're going to be putting out guidelines and recommendations uh, fairly quickly in a few days. You're not rolling out that it would be before I'm May 1st. I'm not going to say, but uh, look, certain states are doing very well. Certain big parts of the country are doing very well. They're doing really very well. And so we're going to be putting out recommendations and guidelines very soon, Steve. Your guidelines be would, would they fit each area, or would they be a uniform? Well, you're going to see. I, I don't want to tell you now, but right now we have a very strong indication that we know 
Pretty much, we have some good ideas. I also do want to get, uh, I want to have, we'll have video conference or at least a conference call with a lot of very good people having to do with certain fields, whether it's energy or whether it's uh, entertainment and restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. We have to get people back into restaurants. We have to do what we have to do, whether it's deductibility or not, we'll see, but it should be deductibility. You'll get them back so fast. I mean, they used to have deductibility. The restaurant business, it, it was one of the hot businesses. And then they ended it a long time ago, many years ago. But we may need that to get people back into the restaurants. Please. Yeah, uh, Michelle Obama today uh, got behind uh, mail-in voting nationwide as, as a possible solution to the, what's been going on in the states. She said it shouldn't be a partisan issue. Uh, have your advisors told you that that could save lives? Have you well, been... absentee ballot are you talking about? Yeah, but on a, on a massive scale because of the coronavirus. Well, I don't know what she did. I mean, I didn't see that. When did that happen today? Yeah, today. She's, she's part of she's well, I wish a nonpartisan group. I wish you a lot of luck. On Labs, you said you had a long yes, Mr. President, uh, there's a little bit of confusion about uh, your uh, phone calls yesterday with President Putin. The Kremlin is saying that you discussed current issues of ensuring strategic security. That wasn't referred to in the White House readout. Uh, can you enlighten us? We discussed us? many things. We did discuss China. Uh, we discussed uh, many different things, but we, it was primarily a call on the oil, as you can imagine. And uh, they were very helpful in getting a stabilization price, a stabilization of the number of barrels. I think the number is going to be closer to 20, maybe 15, but closer to 20 than it is going to be to 10. And I think it was a very important call. I also spoke with the King of Saudi Arabia, and that was a very important call. And the bottom nine is OPEC plus. It's called OPEC plus because there are other states, also other nations. Uh, we came to a very good agreement. Please. Yeah. Go ahead. What was the part about strategic security? Was that? Uh, uh, I would say mostly we were talking about China. We were talking about their borders. And we were talking about our borders a little bit, our borders with Mexico. Because as you know, Mexico was a big part of the deal. And uh, Mexico, uh, really, it was very complex from the standpoint of Mexico. It was not an easy deal for Mexico. And the president, we appreciated a certain amount of flexibility. But we talked about borders. We talked about China, talked about Mexico. But security but, sounds well, like arms the, I mean, I, we did talk about the arms. Yes, we did. That was a very important part of the call, actually. Yeah, good point. Please. So on Abbott Labs, you said testing is going great. We know that they have these machines have been sent to some of the governors, but some of them are saying they don't have the materials to actually conduct. Well, they the have tests. to get the material. You know, the governors have to get the material. Now, if they can't get it, the they're going to see us. I'm talking about the local governments. I'm talking about governors have to get the material. Now, they have machines. In fact, we, we're going to go and I guess Mike to go into it as soon as I leave. They have very powerful machines that they don't know they even have. I'm not talking about Abbott. I'm talking about the governors. They have machines that are used for this. You know what I'm talking. You know what I'm referring to. Very big, very powerful machines. Where in a certain state's case, they're only using 10 percent of their capacity, and they didn't know it. That happens to be Illinois. Okay, well, John, please. Real quick, these 15-minute tests that you've sent out, these new ones that you had in the Rose Garden, they say, including Governor Sununu in New Hampshire, that they don't have the cartridges to actually conduct the test. So when will they get those cartridges? What do you think the answer to that is? Rapidly increasing the numbers. Rapidly increasing the numbers. We look at Rapidly increases. Well. Pretty quickly. They can, they can so do 50,000 a, a day. Well, you have other machines where they can really work. And a lot of the states have the big machines that can do a lot. They didn't even know they had them. They didn't even know that they had them. And Mike is going to be talking about that. And you remember you mentioned uh, several weeks ago the uh, the Google was putting together that website yeah. where that would handle the drive and Google testing. Google and Apple. Have you have you given you Google up and Apple? Have, have you have no. you moved past that? A lot of people don't like it from the standpoint of. Uh, constitutional rights. I mean, a lot of people don't like it, and some people think it's great. No, they are working on that, as I, I understand. The testing website. Remember you said a, yeah, a no, website for Google? And, and, and it's only operating in, I think, five counties in California right, right now. No, Google's that, looking at it, but Google is also working with Apple or looking at something. We have the greatest companies in the world looking at things that, in a year from now, everything that we're looking at now is going to be obsolete. That's how good it is. We have things happening that are Unbelievable. I saw a presentation today that I can't talk about yet, but it's incredible. Plus, I think they're doing, uh, Tony, I think they're doing very well on the vaccines. They're working hard on the vaccines, and I think you'll have an answer for vaccines. I believe that uh, there's some great things coming out with respect to that. Now, you need a testing period, 
but you're going to have some great things. Please. Uh, sir, on the contact tracing that Google and Apple are doing, so different subject on the contact tracing. No, no, this is, this is the right. Google and Apple. I don't know if it's a partnership or what, but they're working on some. Correct. So there was the one. They're working on more than one element. They're working on a couple of different things, Google and Apple. Google is also working on something, as you know, having to do with testing. I believe they're doing that in a singular fashion. So my question is not about the drive through testing website, not that. Okay. On, on Google and Apple's contact tracing, yeah. that they want to, yeah. um, they've got this process now where they can put, a, you know, contact tracing yeah. on your phone. If you opt in, you can be alerted if you've been That's in right. contact with someone with the coronavirus. Do you, how do you feel about well, that? Well, it's an amazing thing, but a lot of people have some very big constitutional problems with it. You know that. Uh, it's an amazing thing. And it would be, actually, as you know, other countries are thinking about using something similar, but not as good. Which other countries are thinking about something uh, I hear Singapore is. Singapore is. Now, Singapore had a little bit of a setback because they had a, they had a, a break, you know that, and, but they'll take care of it. I know, I know the folks in Singapore, they're doing a great job, and uh, they're going to put it back very quickly. But Singapore and other countries are looking at other things, and some countries are doing other things. Would you prefer that Americans use some well, other Well, I don't want to get into that because we have a whole constitutional thing. We have more of a constitutional problem than a mechanical problem. But we will be making a determination on that. That's something we're going to be discussing with a lot of people over the next four weeks. That would be a very accurate way of doing it, but a lot of people have a problem with it. Yeah, please, go ahead. A, a testing question, maybe for Dr. Fauci as well. Can you talk about where the antibody test is and how quickly Well, it's that moving way? along. I think I can speak, because I, I have to leave. Moving along quickly, moving along well. It's a test that's been going along for many, many years, except now we have very modern, very incredible versions of it. But that's moving along. The antibody test uh, moving along very well. Okay, any more COVID-19? COVID-19. Colonel, what soldier on the Steve. Theodore Roosevelt has died? Has, have you determined yes, the status of Captain Crozier, the, the former? Well, that's going through the Navy, as I understand it. The Navy is going to be making decisions on all of that. And uh, they had a break in. I don't think the ship should have been stopping in Vietnam when you have a pandemic, to be honest with you. You know, I don't think the captain should have been writing letters. He's not Ernest Hemingway, as I said before, and he shouldn't have been writing letters. And I don't think, I don't know who gave the orders to stop in Vietnam, but they stopped in Vietnam, and all of a sudden they get on, and now you have over 500 sailors and, and people on the ship that are affected. Uh, I don't know whose idea that was, but that wasn't such a good idea in the middle of a pandemic. Yes, please. Uh, I have a question sorry, on, just one last on, on this question of constitutionality. I'm just wondering what changed your view because nothing changed it. No, no, I know exactly what you're going to say. Nothing changed it. The fact that I want to rely on states, or maybe will, or maybe have, and the fact that we've gotten that's one thing. Right. The fact that I don't want to use the power is another thing. But look, you said look. From the standpoint of the Constitution. Yes, Constitution. You, you thought it should be up to the governors. You can look at constitutionally. You can look at federalism. You can look at it any different way. John, the fact that I don't want to exert my power is much different. We have the power. You ask, does the federal government have the power? The federal government has absolute power. It has the power as to whether or not I'll use that power. We'll see. So I would rather, John, I would rather like work with the states because I like going down to a local government. That's why with, I guess it's now seven states, not eight, That because South Carolina did, uh, you know, they went away from what we discussed the last time. So uh, that's why I looked at the individual states. They're doing a very good job. They're really doing a very good job. I'd rather have them make the decision. Now, the fact that I'd rather have, that's fine. But I have the absolute right to do if I want to. I may not want to. We have a very good relationship. Now, we'll see what happens. If you notice the few states you're talking about, they're all with Democrat governors. But if governors are doing a good job and they control it better because you don't have somebody in Washington saying, set up a testing site in the parking lot of a Walmart, and we're in Washington and they're in a state that's very far away. That's really, it should be, and it should have always been, and I've always said it was. But the relationship we have now with the states and governors is very good. And we'll be announcing over the next very short period of time exactly what we're going to be doing. Okay, a couple more. Go ahead. On coronavirus and Joe Biden, he's the presumptive Democratic nominee. Do you have any plans yet on when you'll start sharing or when the White House will start sharing some of that information about the coronavirus? Your president well, nobody's leader. called about uh, coronavirus about from their standpoint. Look, they had the H1N1, which is swine flu. And that was a big failure. That was a tremendous failure. They had a lot of failures. 
uh, and uh, you take a look at what you take a look at the history, and you know, 17,000 people died, and you talk about late. They were so late, they were late like it never even existed. Uh, that was a that was a big problem. Of course, a lot of other people a big problem too. So, uh, I, you know, if if Joe Biden would like a briefing, I'd certainly get him a briefing. I don't know what he'd do with it. Yeah, please. So are, are Jared and Ivanka uh, on, serving on the on the new task force? And how are you going to balance? No. What? No, they're not. No. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yes, go ahead, please. I just want to clarify. So in earlier conversation, there was a description of multiple different councils or task, task yeah. forces. Can you just explain exactly what the structure is? Well, you is have and Mike's task force, yeah. which is the White House task force, which really brought us up to this point brilliantly, I must say. Uh, dealt with governors and dealt with governors all the way through. and. Uh, and I was on many of those calls, and every call got better and better and better. It was hostile at the beginning by the time we finished. I mean, today's call was a very good call, very friendly call. I think everyone's online. And again, uh, you don't have anybody driving you crazy saying they're not getting ventilators, they're not getting all of the different things, they need more beds. They have a lot of beds right now. And we always erred, I think it's important if you know, we always erred on the sake of give them more. Even when we didn't think. We didn't think New York needed the beds that they were asking for. We didn't think they needed the ventilators that they asked for. And we were right. Now, on ventilators, we're ready to march. I told you this. We're ready to march. We have 10,000 ventilators. We're ready to move them anywhere in the country where we need them, if we need them. We're also uh, building a lot of ventilators. and. That's going to be used at some point. I believe, you know, we're going to have stockpiles, including state stockpiles, if they want to work out some kind of an arrangement with us. But we're also going to help other countries, whether it's Italy or Spain or other France is having a big problem. Uh, they all desperately need Germany, too. They need ventilators. So we're going to have a lot of ventilators. We have a lot. You heard the numbers. We have a lot coming next week. Next week, we have a tremendous amount coming. Okay, final as question, Steve. Regarding, I'd ask, I'd ask about the task, how the task force is going to be structured. Is it one? No. Then we have, uh, in addition to that, we have a number of committees. Uh, we'll have a transportation committee. We're going to have a um, manufacturing committee. You'll see it tomorrow. We're also having a uh, religious leaders committee. We have a great group of religious leaders. We're having committees with religious leaders. You've been seeing what's going on at the churches and uh, all of that. And we're going to have a uh, faith leaders committee. And so we have we're going to have a few committees, I'll call them committees, and then ultimately we're going to make decisions. So we're going to make decisions fairly quickly, and I think they're going to be the correct decision. I hope so, Steve. We form the Economic Task Force tomorrow. When do you want them to have recommendations? Soon. For you? Soon. And they already know what I want. And so when we form, when you say form, I don't have to give them instructions. These are very sophisticated people. These are the best people in their fields. So I don't have to say, gee, let's, we just met, and we're going to meet in two weeks, and here's what we're... I said, here's what I want. We've already told them. And they're the, the best names in the various businesses and professions and religions. I mean, these are the greatest names, the people that I think probably know the best. So we've called them, and we're going to be speaking to them very soon. And we want them to have, if it's questions or statements, we want them to have that for us. And we will have either response or maybe, I mean, ideally, we're going to be learning from them and we'll be able to do that and put them, put everything we learned from those calls into our new guidelines. So we're going to have new guidelines coming soon. I think it's going to be very good. I think it's going to be very smooth. And I hope it's going to be very safe. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Stanley Shara is a friend of mine for a long time. He's a great real estate person passed away, was a great real estate person, great, great, uh, sort of a legend in New York real estate. He called me a couple of weeks ago, said he's tested positive. Stanley's in his uh, early to mid-'80s, I guess. And Stanley went to the hospital, and he never came out. He went into a coma. Uh, he was unconscious for a long period of time, and he never made it. A great man. He left uh, very charitable, really a great philanthropist, a very, very successful person in Manhattan in the real estate business. Uh, so I got to know him a lot. He was uh, so excited when his friend from New York became the president of the United States. He was like, like a young boy. And he was not a young boy, but he was like a young boy. He was so excited. 
he thought would do such a good job, and he was so happy. And he, uh, he was very proud of what we've done in this administration. But he was tested positive, and unfortunately, he, uh, he didn't make it. Uh, it's a very — to me, it's a very sad thing. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.